at the end of this series of lectures, I'd hope to tie everything I've talked about up into one tight package, a set of fundamental principles. I'd hope to make music theory with a capital T. But I find that I can't. Sociologist Howard Becker explained his approach to research and why he avoided theory with a capital T when he wrote, I have a deep suspicion of abstract sociological theorizing. I regard it as, at best, a necessary evil, something we need in order to get our work done, but, at the same time, a tool that's likely to get out of hand, leading to a generalized discourse largely divorced from the day-to-day -day digging into social life that constitutes sociological science. I've tried to tame theory for myself by viewing it as a collection of tricks, ways of thinking that help researchers. I believe that what Becker said about sociology also applies to music theory. Like human society, music is multifaceted, and it's different things to different people. It's impossible to come up with a simple, coherent theory about what music does and how it does it. That leaves us in the same boat as Howard Becker's sociologists, asking questions the answers to which raise a series of new questions. We can come close to understanding how music works, but never achieve a complete understanding because new questions keep arising. I would like to conclude these talks with a personal perspective. I would like to confess how I actually think about music and how my personal conception of music has produced the bag of tricks that I use as a composer and as a music theory teacher. When I was in graduate school, I had a composition lesson with Mel Powell. Mel was a little bit frustrated with me because I couldn't seem to put together a coherent musical thought that actually went somewhere. He scribbled a little chart on a piece of scrap paper. It looks something like this. If you keep the relationships between the items in the chart in mind, he said, you can create coherence and control the motion of the music. When dealing with melody, a staple mode, meaning a collection of pitches in a tonic, is the material. It gives the composer elements to work with that will produce a kind of unity and a certain flavor of sound. To this mode, additional pitches can be added to create chromaticism. Pitches can also be taken away to create a more neutral, less colorful sound. The composer can control the motion of the music through the direction of the melodic line and through the use of leading tones that pull to the notes above or below them. Manipulating these two things can make the music feel like it moves strongly toward an inevitable destination. They can also be manipulated in such a way that the music seems to wander aimlessly. It's up to the composer. In the harmonic realm, the staple chord is the material. This chord can have any intervallic structure. It's often a conventional triad, but it could be a quartal chord in stacked fourths, or even a harsh chord made up entirely of dissonant intervals. While this staple chord's the norm, simpler chords with fewer notes and less dissonance can also be used. The more complex the chord, the more tension it produces. The less dissonant the chord, the more relaxed, the more stable it seems. Harmonic motion can be controlled by using the more complex chords to create tension and the less dissonant chords as points of relaxation like cadences. This process is called harmonic fluctuation. Harmonic motion can also be controlled through the movements of the roots of the chords. This chart was a revelation to me. The instant that Mel presented it, all of the excess baggage of my music theory training was washed away. It became evident to me that I didn't need a bunch of rules that prescribed how I had to compose music. Instead, I needed to decide what I wanted my music to do, and I needed to control the elements in the chart in order to make that happen. The chart allowed me to coherently apply my bag of tricks. Mel also had a method of analysis, but it wasn't all that systematic. It was pretty general and flexible. He suggested that when we begin an analysis, we ask three questions. What changes? When? By how much? To determine what changes, Mel suggested using something he called a criterial index. A criterial index is just a list of the things that the analyst wants to examine. It might include pitch, duration, timbre, dynamics, and so on. When looking at how and when these various things change, patterns emerge. For example, you might find important structural points by finding the places where all the criteria change at the same time. 
you might find easily overlooked features by tracking when easily overlooked musical elements like timbre or dynamics change. I suspect that Mel's method was a simplification and expansion of a method developed by his teacher, Paul Hindemith. Hindemith's work has been devalued over the last few decades. I think this is a shame. In spite of being pedantic and dogmatic, his book, The Craft of Musical Composition, still has a lot to offer. The last chapter of his book consists of a number of analyses. The pieces analyzed range from Gregorian chant to Hindemith's own Mathis der Mahler symphony. Here's my analysis of the opening of the last movement of Hindemith's Kleine Kammermusik. At the top of the analysis is a piano reduction of the piece. Non-chord tones are marked using Hindemith symbols based on their German names. The rest of the analysis is divided into two sections, melodic analysis and harmonic analysis. The melodic analysis section starts with a degree progression. By this, Hindemith means that the notes in a melody tend to imply a certain harmony. Hindemith segments the melody with dotted brackets according to these implied harmonies and he notates the roots of these harmonies on the staff below. Below that staff is the melody step progression. Hindemith viewed melody a lot like Schinker did. He believed that melody was primarily stepwise. Melodies are often interrupted by leaps. These leaps are often not really leaps, but beginnings of new voices that would continue in the same register by stepwise motion. All of the motion in our melody is stepwise, except the leap to the B which can be seen as continuing a line to C-sharp, and then B, where it joins the other voice as it descends back down the scale to E. The harmonic analysis starts off with a two-voice framework. Hindemith believed that most music was based on counterpoint, and that counterpoint was structured through melody and bass line. Below the two-voice framework is the harmonic fluctuation. Harmonic fluctuation is the degree of consonance or dissonance of a chord. This was an important concept for Hindemith. He believed that harmonic motion could be controlled by controlling the level of dissonance, just as it could be controlled by controlling the root movements of chords. He included a nifty chart in the back of the book that delineated different categories of chords based on their levels of dissonance. He used lower value Roman numerals to indicate categories with more consonants. Higher value Roman numerals indicated categories with more dissonance. Arabic numbers were included as subscripts to indicate gradations of dissonance within categories. In our example, the first level of harmonic fluctuation is Roman numeral 1, subscript 1. This is the highest level of consonants, which makes perfect sense because the music starts out with an open fifth. The next chord is a Roman numeral 3, subscript 1. This is a chord, quote, containing seconds or sevenths, where the roots and the bass are identical. This determination requires a little explanation. The notes of the chord from the bass up are D, A, F sharp, B. Since the root and the bass are identical, that would make this a D major chord with an added sixth. Many traditional music theorists would call this a B minor seventh chord in first inversion. I don't think Hindemith would have, and here's why. Hindemith determined the roots of chords by finding the quote-unquote best interval. By best, he meant the lowest in the overtone series, which turns out to be the most consonant. In the case of this chord, the best interval is a perfect fifth from D to A, so D is the root of the chord. This is also reflected in the two-voice framework and in the harmonic degree progression. These two chords are repeated until the seventh major, where a Roman numeral three subscript two appears. This is a chord with a second or a seventh in inversion. The harmonic degree progression indicates the roots of the chords, and it does so with actual pitches on a staff, using the fundamental bass notation favored by Rameau. By using Roman numerals for harmonic fluctuation and actual pitches to indicate root movement, I think Hindemith doomed his system of analysis to failure. He took conventional analytic nomenclature and turned it on its head. But that doesn't mean there isn't value in his method. The idea of analyzing melody separate from harmony is sound, as is the idea of tracking the harmonic fluctuation. Creating a piano reduction from a complex ensemble texture is also helpful to the analysts, as is the creation of a two-voice framework.
all of these types of analysis are not appropriate for every type of music. For example, Hindemith only included melodic degree progression and step progression when he analyzed Gregorian chant. When analyzing a three-part invention, he only included harmonic fluctuation and a harmonic degree progression. I'm a big believer in chord scale theory. In my own analyses, I usually do at least one pass through the piece using chord scale theory. This might replace Hindemith's melodic degree progression. I think there are times when rhythmic structure is important. I might include a Cooper-Meyer type rhythmic analysis. Finally, there are times when dynamics or timbral shifts might be important. Maybe we should find a place in our analyses for this kind of information. So my suggestion for aspiring analysts is to be like Hindemith, only less pedantic, less dogmatic. In other words, be like Mel Powell. I also suggest that aspiring analysts be like A.B. Marx. Marx had a number of agendas when it came to music education, but maybe the most important one was that all musicians need to think like composers. His book, The Theory of Musical Composition, is actually structured around writing music, musical building block by musical building block. One criticism of the book is that while it describes in minute detail what a sonata form is, it doesn't give a complete analysis of one. I think this was because Marx actually expected the student to compose his or her own example. Marx's method was a learn-by-doing kind of method. Take, for example, the development section of a sonata. What's its form? Well, it doesn't really have one in the same way that, say, a binary form has a form. It has no set list of parts. So how is it structured? Well, just about any way you want. A development section usually has sequences. These can be based on one of the themes of the piece or not. So a development section can be anything you want it to be. How do you find out what a development actually is? Try writing one yourself. You might start out with the first theme, but in the dominant. Before the first theme is over, before it even reaches its first cadence, the music feels like it wants to veer off in another direction. You rein it in by starting the first theme again, but this time transposed down a step. As that statement of the theme reaches its cadence, you start the theme again, but this time truncated and down a step. You play the truncated theme again, down another step. The music wants to build up some momentum, so you state the first three notes of the theme again double time, and down a step. You do that again, but this time with the B natural. By reaching the B, you've gotten back to a pitch that can lead you to tonic, but this truncated motive feels like it needs an extension to create a strong cadence. You create an extension out of the scale-like material from the end of the theme. You end in a dominant chord that will lead you back to tonic at the start of the recap. So what has this process taught you? First, the development sections are going to music. They're not filled with thematic statements and strong cadences, but rather with music that's constantly pushing forward, evading cadences. The process is also very intuitive. In my description, I kept using words like what the music wants to do. While there is some conscious choice involved, mostly the music tells the composer what it wants to do. This is a lot like stream of consciousness writing as opposed to writing a poem, which would have a structured line length, a structured meter, and a structured rhyme scheme. It's a lot like soloing in jazz. There's a head where the theme is presented, and then there are solo sections where the soloist develops ideas from the theme. Using analysis as a way to understand music works great. Using composition as a way to understand music works great. I would also advocate experimentation. Let's do an experiment. I will play the opening movement of Mozart's Sonata K545 twice. Try to determine what the difference between the two performances is. If you're in a hurry, fast forward through this section to get to the results quickly.
the difference between the two versions is that in the first version, the movement ends in the tonic. In the second version, it ends in the subdominant. Is one version more stable than the other? Is the recap in one version more satisfying than the other? Did you actually notice any difference between the two versions? In my experience doing this experiment with students, the answer to the last question is usually no. Most listeners do not hear any difference between the two versions. This means that returning to tonic at the end is not based on things that listeners can normally perceive. This is an important assertion, and it's backed up by the experiment. I should probably also mention that in the first version, the original Mozart, the recap starts in the subdominant and not in the tonic. So apparently Mozart didn't see any reason why a recap needed to start in tonic. In this series, we've attempted to understand music through melody, harmony, and counterpoint. We've seen how language can give a rhythmic structure to music. We've seen how music theorists have attempted to systematize music by borrowing techniques from the physical sciences, acoustics, psychology, and sociology. All of these studies are enlightening, but in the end, in order to really understand the music, we need to study the music itself. In order to do so, I recommend three methods, analysis, composition, and experimentation. I don't think that chasing music theory with a capital T is very productive. That's not just because the big theories seem to do a better job of justifying their own existence than they do of explicating music. It's because music's just not that systematic. Music does have structure, but what that structure is varies wildly depending on style, time period, and the whims of the composer. That's mostly because music is not really about structure. The structure is just there to get the musical message across. Music may not be a language, but it's like a language. Music may not have meaning, but it carries a message that can be interpreted. Analyzing fundamental structure in music is a lot like analyzing the ink on the page in order to understand Shakespeare. It throws away the message in order to establish a foundation. Schenkerian analysis, for example, does this very kind of thing. It throws away the message in search of foundational structure. So that leaves us with music theory with a small letter T. This leaves us practicing music theory in a way that's similar to the way that Howard Becker practices sociology. We examine each question with an ad hoc array of tools and techniques. Each answer we come up with leads to a new question. And while each investigation increases our understanding, it will never lead to a breakthrough that will explain everything once and for all. Even if finding the answer were possible, as soon as a universal explanation for how music works appears, somebody will just write some new music that defies it. Music is not some lifeless static thing. It's a living, breathing cultural phenomenon. It's a moving target, and even if we were to hit it, another target, a different target, would just come along to take its place.